Ford is doing something that has never been done. I've worked on a bunch of different vehicles at Ford, but I've never worked on anything like this. We're introducing a new truck. The truck, the new F-150 SVT Raptor. And this will just continue the momentum and help prove uh, F-150 is the best truck in the market. We gotta build a truck and we gotta go test it. In the, and we gotta test, test, test. And that means racing. The uh, idea of using racing to prove out production platform is not new. Uh, Ford Motor Company has done that throughout its history. We can point back to 1965, when we were indeed we were racing production-based Mustangs. When it comes to racing, Ford has pretty much been everywhere, from the track to the strip. Desert. We're taking the rigor and the demands and the challenges of off-road racing and making sure we're putting in the hands of our customers a highly competent, highly developed, highly engineered, totally proved out, off-road capable, yet street production truck that you could buy from your dealership. The current challenge, going off-road, way off-road. To this day, Ford's presence in off-road racing is undeniable, and this marks the first time they've taken a pre-production truck to Baja to test it. For this daring and top-secret project, Ford wanted to recruit a team of the top racers in the field. I got a call from Cliff, and he said, uh, hey, uh, we're talking about doing this Raptor truck. I know you're a little familiar with this top secret program. I said, I am. I said, I've, I've heard some rumblings. He said, well, it's actually, uh, it's a real deal. And uh, what we want to do is we want to test this thing. And uh, I said, well, I've heard you guys have been doing a little testing. He goes, I'm talking about really testing this, going to Baja. Our mission today is to get all of us together and talk about our plan for the Baja 1000. This is the Raptor. The vehicle's about going off-road fast. We expect our customer to drive the car to work every day, but then on the weekend, he's gonna go out in the desert and play. So we had to make this car good to drive to work every day, comfortable, steer well, brake well, handle well, ride well, but then go to the desert and, and go like hell. The Raptor Summit was kind of a uh, all hands on deck. Um, that was the first reality check, I think, for everybody that uh, we might actually pull this thing off and get it done. The racing program is not a Ford factory effort to go showcase and go beat up on everybody in Baja. That's not what we're in Baja to do. This team has been put together to help Ford prove out the Raptor. Racing the truck has been part of the development plan from day one. And to do that, they'll need to build a race version of the truck, the Raptor R. You know, Base Raptor is a pretty special product. You know, it's completely engineered, meets all Ford standards, and building on that um, is critical to the success of the product. Obviously in the rear, this is where the differentiation really starts to get really strong between the two trucks. Looks great. This is pretty awesome. At the heart of both Raptors is an entirely new power plant from Ford. It's a 6.2 liter V8. We're pretty confident in this engine. It's a really modest horsepower. It's probably enough for the race engine. We want to get that uh, vehicle to the finish. We want to make sure we finish. We've put some very durable components in it. It should be bulletproof. It should run forever. Ford invited those who will drive the Raptor R to this meeting. Bud Brutzman, Gene Martindale, Randy Merritt, Steve Oligas, Greg Fouts. 
In addition to driving, Greg will be in charge of fabricating the race truck at his home base in Arizona. In off-road racing, we have this balancing act that we always have to do, and there's a fine line between how much horsepower, how much axle, how much transmission, and all of the components. And, you know, the big play is when the guy's driving the truck, he's got to be able to have enough power not to get stuck all the time but not so much power that he's ripping the axles out of the rear end or blowing transmissions up all the time. It's like going to the moon. I'm not kidding. It's, it's like going to the moon. You guys are doing simulations and drag races and all that's awesome. This is like driving to the moon. It's ridiculous. All combined, this driving team has decades of off-road experience. When you talk about wheel travel to off-road guys, it's like talking about horsepower to drag racing guys. <laughs> More you can have, the better you are. Gene Martindale has the most experience with this truck. He's been part of the development team on the Raptor project. One of the things this does is actually tells us a ton about the vehicle itself. So we said we need to get it, get the truck racing before we launch so we are sure we find any weak points that we didn't see in all of our testing. Now it's time for the special vehicles team to introduce the race team to the Raptor. The thing that was great about a, a pre-runner desert racer is that it has a common theme with all SVT products before it. They go fast. They go really fast. Just looking at it, this experienced crew of racers can already see how well this truck is going to move. All throughout the vehicle, it's clear that performance was part of the design. It's quite unbelievable when you see the truck and see what it's capable of. And, and I'm, I'm talking the stock Raptor, uh, which the race the truck is essentially a stock Raptor with a safety and cage in it. They really did a great job taking the underpinnings on F-150 and wrapping it into a really, a really solid pre-runner. Started getting familiar with some of the components, you know, the Fox internal bypass shocks that were going to be on, the, on that truck and, you know, the 35-inch tall tires from BF Goodrich and all of the special suspension components that makes that truck like seven inches wider than a regular, you know, stock F-150. So we started to realize that they really, you know, they took the whole suspension off of one of those trucks and threw it in, in, the, in the can and started from scratch for the Raptor truck, which is, you know, that's a big feat. And that kind of surprised me a little that they, they went that far into it. It's a real truck. This looks awesome. Awesome. But there's also a stark realization. Baja is only a few months away. And then, of course, racers being racers, you know, we said, hey, we can do this. Let's make it happen. So we said, let's figure out how to do it, and let's just break neck, and let's do it. Phoenix, Arizona, the headquarters of Fouts Racing, where Greg Fouts and his team will be building the Raptor R. This is our race headquarters where we do our, our prep work and uh, also where the F-150 Raptor Baja race truck's being built right now in the room next door to us. I think that the Ford guys, you know, when they, when they kind of put their stake in the ground and said, we want to go do this, they picked the toughest, hardest, most challenging thing that they could do and, uh, you know, that'll be the testament to how tough that truck is. The team already has a donor F-150 completely pulled apart. So that's what you'll get if you go buy a Raptor at the dealership that'll come with all this. Fox shocks, special extra long arms. These things are like four inches longer than the regular F-150. Look at that, here's the upper arm. It's like three inches longer than the stock one. Pretty cool. I'm really glad we got this prototype cup holder, though. How tough are the sidewalls on these? These things are bulletproof. The, these BF Goodrich Baja teams like this are, are awesome. Just ridiculous. You have to do something really stupid to blow you, the sidewall. You will, if you get a flat, you will earn it. big to come up with a project like this in this timeline and throw it down there and say, we want to finish. 
Much of what they're dealing with at this point is the roll cage. It's a Baja requirement. Hours of TIG welding are going into making the cage up to spec. But before this prerequisite can be crossed off the to-do list, a little surgery is required. All right, let's cut this thing in half. Don't try this at home, kids. I don't know, I think, I think there's probably a couple guys that would be mortified if they saw us with the big sawzall, like sawing the cab in half. So we went through $100 in blades to cut the roof off this thing. Built Ford tough. Cutting through the high strength steel is very frustrating. And after 20 blades, the cab is finally free. We pulled the top off because we have to weld underneath it. You can't get to all the welds. If you look up on the top, you have to get the roof off so you can get to all these intersections and weld them fully. You gotta do it, it's not legal to race it without doing that. That's why we uh, hacked the top off. It's now as torn apart as a truck can be. It's time to build. But first, they need a power plant. This is a completely brand new design for Ford Motor Company. So here it is. This is a 6.2 that we'll be using for the race. What are the difference between this and the one that uh, we're putting in the race truck? Well, right now, this is, you know, as it would go into the regular Raptor engine. Uh, but what we're going to change, the throttle body, our objective is to get the 500, so we're actually going to show you some of the machining that we're going to do in here to try to get a little bit more airflow. We're going to build uh, headers from scratch. Um, the heads will be lightly ported, and we got some really killer cams that the guys uh, at UMDO are building for us. Yeah, this is the heart and soul of the Raptor, and we're just uh, massaging it just a little bit. In this shop, the Raptor project represents a lot of different things. It's extra credit. It's top secret, and most of all, it's passion. When it comes to a project like this, there are a lot of hands that go up in the air from people that want to work on it. Many of them do it on their own time uh, and are on-road or off-road racers. The tolerance is like plus or minus five microns, so it's pretty close. Well, the size of a human hair is about 100 microns. The powertrain team at Ford is eager to learn about the rigors of the Baja 1000 from Brutzman, who's raced there many times. Anything that you can do to a motor or a transmission or anything that, that is possible that you're not supposed to do, we're going to do. And not yeah. because we're bad, and that's just, it's, it's the environment. Yeah. If, you're at, if you're at 4,000 RPMs and you're not supposed to jam it in the first, guess what? Yeah. We, yeah. we probably have to do it. It's not, it's not a matter of us being stupid. We're hanging off a cliff, we're going right. up the hill. To say Baja is the toughest race out there doesn't begin to explain it. For a vehicle, it's the toughest test of any kind, period. Ford knows that running well in this event will give Raptor one indisputable thing, absolute credibility. Mike, what do you guys do that's different for an endurance race? We're doing a race in 30, let's say 28 to 35 hours. Hardcore racing, we'll we stop for maybe two minutes Every six hours, we'll stop for two minutes, get gas, change drivers, and get out. But what do you do? You do things different to the design of the bottom of the block? No, I mean we, that's how we test our engines when we test them for durability. We we run them for 435 hours flat out. This is the Raptor 6.2 power plant as it goes through its last dyno check. Now she's ready for the big trip to Arizona. Parts and pieces are here, but like all things, progress is relative. The team is making headway, but one fact remains. The Baja 1000 is now a little more than a month away. That's not a lot of time to get this project together.
it was chaos in our shop. The, the place looked like a bomb had gone off for months. There was just old pieces of uh, exhaust and the bed from the blue truck and all that stuff is just scattered all over the floor in the one side of the shop. Well, there's a huge sense of urgency. We've taken a, an 18 month build process and shortened it to about five months. So we're here with the best that we can find in the business and uh, they're doing a good job. Yeah, call, go ahead, get some masking tape. Do something, would you? Make yourself useful. Don't, don't. You know, I do have to say, Bud was really good at digging. He rode with me at the last race. We kind of got stuck in the silt, like three foot deep for like a couple hours. He dug like a farmer for hours. It was great. So it's important for Baja to train. And anytime you drive a Greg, you have to learn how to shovel. Where is the love? What happened to all the love? How's that, Greg? <laughs> And just to add to the pressure, this truck needs to be fully operational in less than a month for its official unveiling at the SEMA show in Las Vegas. This is the best donut I've ever had. Soaked in race fuel. Nice. Yeah, this is high dollar, high speed duct tape. No race shop should be without it. In from Detroit, Dave Dillaway sorts through the unneeded wires. Things like a backup camera are not needed in Baja. You want to have the fewest amount of wires to find so that you can get running again as fast as you can. Downtime is not your friend. These are actually stock calipers, too, for the Raptor truck. Look how big those are. For a, oh, yeah, for a stock truck, that's a huge break. Ford stuff, they're dynamite. I can go almost a whole season on one set of brake pads on my Super Duty truck. They're and dynamite? It'll, it'll weigh 1,000 pounds more than this baby. The next step is a big one. I think we're gonna try to fire this thing up, start it up. Doug, grab me another extension like this right over there, a longer one. The timeline is already insane. If the truck doesn't start, it's going to be one major setback. accomplished a lot today. Team did a great job. We got the truck running finally. So next thing is we're going to get the suspension underneath it, get the new rear end in, get it over the chassis dyno, run it a little bit, and get ready to go to Baja. SEMA show in Las Vegas is preparing to open its doors. Ford is getting ready to unveil a lot of vehicles here in the convention center. But before Raptor gets settled indoors, she has a date in the desert. quite unusual for the automotive press, Ford has brought the show to the desert. There's a lot of pressure here for Ford. Nobody has ever tried to make a truck like this before. This is radically different than an SVT Lightning was. It's a whole new market. It's a whole new genre. It's a, it's a market that no one has ever done in off-road. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of like you're, you're swinging for the fence, but, you know, it's either hero or zero. So, yeah, it's, it's pressure. The press unveiling is for both the Baja Racing Raptor R as well as for the production Raptor, a factory truck that will also be making tracks off-road. It's a ride that'll have a lot of people talking. A truck with a warranty coming out of a, a, you know, a factory should not be able to do the things that this thing is doing.
anticipation is high as both trucks make it onto the scene. Two models of the soon to be in production Raptor F-150. Now it's time to turn up the volume. It's a terrific day. It's a you know, day we've been waiting for for a long time. This program's been two years in the making and, and a lot of excitement and enthusiasm about a, a real, true off-road performance truck. And so now we get to share the excitement with uh, a lot of other people that are really uh, enthusiastic about the uh, sport. And they'll share that excitement in a whole new way because the press is going for a ride, getting to see firsthand what this new truck can do. And people are just floored at how cool it looks and how fast it goes and how comfortable it is in this really rough, gnarly terrain, you know? all that terrain like a like an animal. They're really impressive. Man, really truly Just spectacular. Cool, cool. I'm glad you liked it. That was that was outrageous. I uh, I've ridden in a professional in a terrible herps free runner truck, which is also a Ford. And this felt every bit as fast and every bit as competent. And that was a uh, I'm sure, you know, what, maybe six figure? professional pre-runner truck that was that was pretty that was pretty mind-blowing I mean how much faster do you, do you need to go than that we we're going we hit 100 miles an hour like three times in the desert with two foot bumps I mean outrageous just got hit in the head with a whole lot of fast the early word is this truck is a hit my market my guys are the guys that live and breathe dirt they they're out there playing all the time when you work all week you need something to go do and let out your stress on the weekend, whether you're a rock crawler or a mud bogger or a desert pre-runner type guy. It's a niche, but nobody was addressing that niche to this extent, and I think they did a great job. It's been a big day for Ford and the Raptor, but the race team is already looking beyond today, setting their sights on Baja. They've been through a lot, but there's still so much more left to do. We're through the first phase, right? We got the truck basically done. We start in doing the tuning and stuff like that. And then we start into the next phase, which is now we got to get ready for the race. Are there big surprises yet? We don't know. We're mixing three or four race teams together to pull this effort off. Ford has gathered experts from everywhere, including a seasoned Baja 1000 veteran. Jeff Cummings, BF Goodrich. He's the mastermind behind the maps of the course, how to get from A to B, and uh, timing. Pit guy's got to be at uh, checkpoint two at three o'clock, leave at two o'clock. Madman, Mr. Baja. They've picked the right man because Jeff is the guy who knows the right formula. It will definitely uh, be a test of both man and machine as the thousand always is. You stop paying attention on this year's race course and good likelihood that's where your race will end. We have to be smart enough to finish that race knock it all wrapped up and all the garbage that's going on down there and just get the truck to the finish line. And I think that's going to be the toughest thing, making sure we do that. If you're going to be the baddest man in the ring, you're going to go down and you're going to take on the Baja 1000 and show what you got. Welcome to Baja and to the event racers know as contingency. It's supposed to be a vehicle check, but it's become the biggest party this side of Mardi Gras. I'm not really 
sure why they put you through the rat maze. Uh, you know, if you're going to go through town, you're signing autographs, you're handing out stuff, you're giving stickers away. It's a phenomenon that it, you have to see it to believe it. You can't imagine what it's like. We're on our way to technical inspection here at the Ensenada uh, Main Street. It's been blocked off so that we can have the, all the street vendors set up, all the racing vendors set up. And there are people everywhere. One thing is certain. This truck is making some serious waves. I think a lot of people are kind of blown away. Yeah, Very cool definitely truck. Definitely a lot of Ford fans in this group. That's right. <laughs> we bleed Ford blue. People want to know what's going on with this truck. I mean, it's uh, you know to be, see the full race truck and what you know looks to be the production truck is amazing. You know, it, it's if you walk by, it looks like two race trucks. So uh, it's taking a lot of people to go, oh man, that's that's a production truck. I can own that. So really exciting. The most common question I have is, are they really going to sell it with those shocks and everything like that? That's huge. Man, that thing is badass. Aren't we proud of our Team Raptor? <laughs> team Raptor, that is finest. Rapidor. How proud Rapidor. can I be? Lucho Libre! We got to contingency early and get it through the whole circus and get everything signed off so we can test the vehicle a bit more. We load the truck back up, grab a crew of guys, and we're going to go down to a place called Guadalupe Wash, where we have raced in years past for the 1,000 in the Baja 500. starting to get dark. So we get down there, we make a couple passes, we decide everything's pretty good. We're gonna just aim the lights, you know, all the Casey lights on the top. We had just got done with the light bar, so we needed to aim them. So we sit in the wash, aim the lights, run back and forth a few times. Well, now all of a sudden, there's something wrong. We don't know what's going on. The engine starts to misfire a little bit. And then the little lights started, the alternators, and little things were going on, and it was just all little stuff, but the little stuff turned out to be big stuff. got back into it and fired her up, and they said, okay, bud, you take it out. And we are hauling ass down there, and I went to turn a corner, the truck dies. Hey guys, Cliff, you know what, let's just fix it here. Roger. Greg, if you want to bring everybody down here, this is our new home base. We're not getting this truck out. The truck's dead. It won't start, it won't run, it won't do anything. It won't idle. The um, minute it starts up, it just blah, 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 and dies. The team spends hours down in Guadalupe Wash. It's 11 o'clock and still no luck. Shh, you know, what are we gonna do? The truck won't run, races in the morning. You know, we spent all this effort and time for the last three months, you know, busting our balls to get down here and it won't run. You know, I'm thinking, wow, we're, we're screwed. With the aid of the production Raptor, the race truck is pulled from the sand and returned to base. Arr. 
A tense and troubled ghost hunt begins as the Ford engineers, led by Dave Dillaway, get on the phone with the specialists back in Dearborn. It's a tense troubleshooting session that goes on through the night, posing a very real question. Will this team actually be racing in the Baja 1000? As time goes on, it looks doubtful. Is it one of those sliders? That cow connector. This is cow pocket. See here? The amount of pressure, time, and energy it took to get that truck built and get it down here and to have it die in the parking lot is not, not right. I sure like it when the truck will run. Yeah, 305 here, 605 back at Mother Ford country. And uh, these two guys have been dialing war dialing everybody that they know for calibration. Okay, he's gonna start it up right now. Listen to this. Cross our little finger. I was told to go to sleep, so I went to sleep about, I don't know, 2.30, something like that. Couldn't really sleep, sitting there thinking, you know, oh, man, I wonder if they got it running, I wonder if they got it running, and all of a sudden it was time to get up, so I come walking out and everyone's just standing around, the hood's still up, doors are open, and I'm like, oh, they didn't get anything fixed, man. Got up at seven the next morning. They're still playing with it, they're still playing with it. All of a sudden, 8 o'clock in the morning, thing fires up. Let's go for a ride. I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, please, God, please, you know, let it be. Slowly lay on the gas, you know, burn, burn, burn. I look at Dave, I'm like, well, what do you think? He says, well, we'll see what you got. Whoa! Greg gave me the thumbs up, and um, yeah, I, I'm not one of those, I don't, I don't, I don't cry a whole lot, but man, I had tears in my eyes. It was a, to think of the effort and the pre-running and the time and energy uh, to not make this race. <clears throat> I don't think I was ready for. Wow. He gets out of the truck and he's crying. He's got tears rolling down his eyes. The wind was pulling tears out of our eyes just from the wind. I was like, it's a good thing because I think I'm gonna cry. You know. Was... Um, he said it was the wind, but that's bullshit. He was crying. Bro. <laughs> It was uh, engaging a system that is no longer part of our product, so um, we just decided to swap the harness out to save time because we're chasing ghosts. And looks like we uh, found it. So, Good job. Dave. Away we go. Save the day. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Getting out of that truck after the emotional roller coaster like that was just crazy. And then everybody had to immediately, we're late. 
New problem. Now everybody has to get to the starting line on time. The crew, the technicians, the chase teams, and those who are part of the support system. Every single member of this organization has to scramble. They all have to make it to their starting positions, and that includes the drivers responsible for getting behind the wheel of the Raptor. Thank God. We're going to go racing. We're going to finish this damn thing. So that's what's going to happen. Now it's time to get busy. was amazing uh, we, we got down there and it's like uh, Mardi Gras Disneyland uh, World's Fair everything put together I mean it's a national holiday down here you'll be fine Stay, right. just go conservative it'll be all right yeah. go to the way you normally do it go to what's comfortable Steve is like I was afraid he's gonna wet his pants he's so he's so uptight you know he's just like you can just feel the energy coming off of him man he could have burned toast on that dude that day Put him at the starting line where there's a million things going on and all these people are trying to touch the truck and setting booby traps for you and there's cars going everywhere and there's carnage. I'm like, oh man, we made it. Vehicles have been going off the starting line since 6.30 a.m., one every 30 seconds. Raptor start time is 11.30 a.m. This year's course needs to be completed within 31 hours to avoid disqualification. But before a team can hit the course, everyone gets a handshake from the great Sal Fish. All of a sudden, man, that line's going quick. Every 30 seconds, there's a car off, and I'm going up on the podium. And now it's on, you know, now we gotta go. Go! Le Mans, just driving down there, people all, uh, all over the bridges, all over the walls, cameras going off like flashes, like the, the Super Bowl team running out for Super Bowl. I mean, just flashes all over the place. And it's actually a little hard to see the course because there's so many people, it's like partying into the Red Sea when you're trying to drive. Right away, Steve is in the truck and he's passing a couple of people. Finish, finish, finish. Run 60%. Do not beat the truck. Your job is to deliver the truck to the next guy with all the body panels and all the tires intact and no damage. That's your job. I don't care if you get there five hours behind everybody. That's all you have to do. Keep going. Keep following this road. His team saw it and he would be the first to admit it. Steve began the race totally on edge. I was pretty nervous. In fact, I felt like I didn't even know how to drive. You know, like, oh, I don't know if I can do this, you know. And about five seconds later, that was gone. And people are all waving you this way and that way. Sometimes they wave you the wrong way. It's easy right, easy right. That's when we saw, you know, Robbie Gordon had an accident. Adam Swartz, I think, went off the road. Great drivers having problems. And that's when it sinks in, like, hey, this is Baja. We're not on a pre-run. This is a real deal. Mark or 10 or 15, yeah, probably about 12, 15 miles of the course, everybody stopped. Right. Right. Copy, Raptor running clean. Oh, fuck, we got a pile up. All right. 
Yeah, fucking all the whole race is piled up. God dang it. There was a big traffic jam and there was about 20 of us and people getting out of their cars to go help the cars up there to pull them, gank them, flip them over, whatever they got to do. This is part of the essence that's Baja, unpredictability on the course. You won't see this in any other race. The most carnage is in the first 50 or 60 miles where people are just getting too stupid. You get amped up on the race and you go in there and that translates down to your right foot and you didn't just hammer it down and, and you know there's pictures around and cameras around and people are uh, you know high-fiving you and you just want to race. You feel like a racer, you feel like King Kong and you forget that you got to keep that truck together. As Raptor tackles the first leg of the race, its five chase teams are also on the move, getting into planned positions along the course. The mission of these all-important support crews is to deliver drivers and aid the Raptor if it runs into trouble. We just, everybody distributes out and starts running the chase plan. It's sheer hills with huge boulders. The north crew heads up north towards pit one to help them at pit one. We had south to rendezvous with them at 193 for the first, first driver's point. For some perspective, imagine an Indy or NASCAR crew unable to be within miles of their car for most of the race. It didn't even seem like we were in a race at that point because we're so far away from the truck. But everything's happening, everything's clicking into position. All the chase crews end up kind of convening and everything just starts flowing beautifully. You know, thank God, it was all just happening like it was supposed to. It was so surreal. Back on course, Raptor clears the accident. Can't see. Okay, straight, 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 straight. Left, left down here. The first chase team must quickly get into position because the Raptor is surprisingly ahead of schedule. go and we head to Ojos and I'm I got Dave Dillaway with our group just in case they have an electrical problem we'll be at the first point we can get to them and uh, they beat us to Ojos Negros and I'm talking to uh, Randy Merritt's guys who were there you know doing that that checkpoint for us there's about 45 miles into the race or so you know we saw some trophy trucks and guys going by and and here came Steve you know uh, came in running looked really good and we we're just all excited you know if anything was gonna break it would have happened right away it was kind of what we figured and I was like well, how'd they come through he goes he's passed like three guys already I'm like well how the hell is he passing people already you know I thought this was conservative so we you know eventually we get on the radio and he's like no I'm just cruising it just happened I don't know I'm just cruising you know we passed a couple of them stuck on a hill we passed a guy here we passed a guy there it just happened gurgled a little bit and we got an announcement from them they're at race mile 60 which is past the uh, rough stuff that I saw pre-running so they're past that and they're headed up the hill uh, running clean <laughs> Let's get everybody saddled up. They're at race mile 79 right now, doing 28, 28, 28 miles an hour. Perfect. Everything's running smooth. We're good to go. This is, this is what it's all about. Uh, another 20 hours of this, and uh, we'll be there. But it's a long 20 hours. The truck is gaining ground fast as the chase crews hurry to every possible vantage point to set eyes on the Raptor.
we're getting reports and reports how far our car away is, and, and uh, so we just we want to, you want to look at them, you want to hear, listen to the engine, hear for any rattles, look for any flat tires, anything. You just want to get a visual on that truck. So sure enough, Steve comes hammering down this road. on the pavement, out of the dust, you hear this monster. Robbie Gordon is on your ass. Where's the water? I need water. It's on that roll cage, too. Here, here? No, down, down. Aggressive trophy truck driver Robbie Gordon is an ominous presence to have directly behind you. So here's the cool thing. The cool thing is that, you know, the Ford Raptor, which wasn't even a truck four months ago, is leading Robbie Gordon in the Baja 1000. Adding to the stress, Raptor is now about to descend one of the steepest grades in Baja, La Romorosa. Now, La Romorosa grade is this 4,000-foot cliff that they, they, they carved goat trails in that, that zigzag, switchback goat trails. Looks like a mining road. That La Marosa thing? Yeah. Holy shit. Drive good, Steve. We came down that grade, which is about mile high drop offs. About my least favorite thing to do down here is go down that thing. Okay. This one we're gonna have to do some back. Yeah, we are. We're gonna fucking three point it all the way. Yeah. Quarter mile stop three-point turn back up. It's, it's, it's like a donkey road. See why I don't like this? Yeah, I know. It's kind of crazy though. Like, if you do fall, you're done. We almost down the state. Yeah, I still got a little while to go. On this year's winding course, pits two and three are in the same location, ready to assist the drivers and get them on their way. Welcome to uh, Borrego pit two and three in the BF Goodrich pit network. We'll be seeing our first vehicle here in a little while, and uh, they'll actually come by this location twice. Borrego at the BF Goodrich pit there was like race pit chaos from hell. Because they went through that pit twice, everybody and their brother was there with all of their chase crew and all of their junk all in this one spot for both pits. So the guys at BF Goodrich, man, they might as well have had tasers out to control the crowd because there were so many people there. We're expecting them through here, uh, BFG pit two, the Borrego area at uh, 7.54 tonight. So we're three, four hours early. We're just kind of hanging around waiting for them. Been listening to the radio to see if we've heard anything. Um, it's the status of the truck and really haven't heard, haven't heard much. Don't know that we have a whole lot of radio contact right now with them. Pit one, race mile 150. I'll jerk him out. You're gonna what? You heard me. Car's about a mile out. Steve's coming in. He's done a great job. Um, they're gonna put me in the in the co-driver's seat. Steve and I are going about 50 miles. I'm pumped. Okay, you're coming in, Steve. Easy, easy, easy. To your right. Nice job. It 
a short stay at pit one, the co-riders switch, refueling takes place, and there's a lightning quick checkup of the truck. How is it through here? It seems wild from where I'm sitting, just people all over the place and uh, this uh, kind of a dust just coming down the valley, so hopefully it's uh, going to clear up a little bit. And they're running in third place. They're, they're like, you know, making time and running in third place. I was like, man, this is crazy. And the second place truck is sitting in the pit across from us and they're ripping the steering out of this thing. I mean, they're throwing parts from under the hood like, like madmen. As night falls, it's a new race with different challenges at every turn. Even so, it's all still on course for the Raptor. Everything has been fantastic so far. Uh, we haven't had any mechanical issues. I haven't heard of any tire changes, nothing. So this is pretty much flawless up to this point. Lots of credit has to go to Steve Oligas, who drove through the difficult conversion from desert sun to the absolute darkness of a Baja night. When the night was coming down, it was a little hard to see. Bud was kind of guiding me, and then we were a mile away from where I'm supposed to give the car to Bud, and that's when, that's when things got bad. It got real bad. We're doing great. We're doing awesome. Um, then we get to this area where it just it looks like it looks like war. You're doing great. There you go. You see it. Great job. Now where? To the Come left, again. right to follow that hole. Nice and easy. You're fine. Now you're on course, by the way. To the right. Follow to the right. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, yeah. Shit. Okay, you're gonna have to cut left. Look, cut left a little bit. But all the cars are going that way. I mean, it's just dust, like this huge dust cloud. It looks like someone dropped a bomb there. It's just a huge dust cloud. There's stuff going everywhere. I think it's to the right every seat. Well, I don't know. Look at the look at the GPS. I know. Steve, you gotta trust your GPS, dude. We pulled in that thing and we just sunk in quicksand, this talcum powder. And it all hung in the valley. And we could not see anything. And I'm looking at Bud, we're lifting up everything. So as soon as I got out of the truck, I pulled my helmet off. A really close friend of mine named Todd Clement from Wide Open Baja, he pops out of the bushes. I mean, literally, like, it, like, it, was, a, it was a bad movie that I was dreaming. I got out, I looked at the front of the car, and all of a sudden Todd goes, hey, bud, what's going on? I'm like, Todd, you have a truck here? He goes, yeah, you have a truck here. Can you pull us out? Sure. And it was that easy. He's in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere, 190 miles from, from, the, from the start line, hours from anywhere, and Todd's there with a truck. Of course, right? Even with this lucky turn of events, there's no time for celebration because it's dark, it's dusty, and this is the Baja 1000. I looked, and Bud was gone. I thought he got hit. popped up over there and he was okay and I gave him the thumbs up and I'm like 
This ain't fun anymore. You know, you almost got clocked by a class seven going by. <laughs> I was having a good run and if something happens to Bud, I'm not gonna have a good time. Because I was the one that told him to go out there. Brutzman was less concerned about his close call and more interested in getting his team through the chaparral, one way or another. Uh, Bud had a flashlight and he was guiding me and he would walk up and he put the flashlight and go here and I'd drive over there and it was like connecting dots. I drove here, 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 here. And my crew was, I, I, I knew they were just a mile down the road but what happened is we couldn't see the course anymore. It was so torn up and deep. surviving the ordeal of being stuck for over an hour, a mile outside the exchange. They finally arrive at the spot where Steve will be able to get out from behind the wheel. Hit our siren, see if they can hear our siren. Yeah, you're left, you're left. Yeah. Turn left and go slow. Yeah, that's you, that's you. Slow down. Our left, 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 go through. There you go, right there. Nice job, fellas. With Brutzman now driving, Mike will now take his position as the co-rider. Before long, the Raptor is once again ready for the road. Ellen, you got me? Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. Ready? All right, you're clear. You're clear. All right, be All right, safe. Buddy. Bring it home. All right. Tell me where I'm going, to the right? Yeah, you're going to go 45 degrees. To the right, right here. OK? All right, it's going to be dustier as hell, obviously. You know, keep going straight. Still straight. Relatively. You know, okay, I need some input though. I like a lot of input. I'm not gonna drive crazy. We're doing good. Yeah, all we have to do, we're, we're getting there. Good pace, good pace. Ball has his way of like you're, you're hammering over these rocks like this, and all of a sudden there's it's like the heavens opens up. You have this beautiful graded road in front of you. So you stab the throttle in your first gear, and second gear, and third gear, and right at the end of that, it's just something nasty that'll break the truck. You got you got to lock the brakes up and get it back down to the crap. Fortunately, the wild paths soon open up into miles of open road in the dry lake bed known as Laguna Salada. Laguna Salada is a beautiful, beautiful dry lake bed that during the day is awesome when you don't have dust and you're in it. At night, um, it's just pitch black and there's tons of dust hanging over there and you know the race trucks have gone through there and you can kind of see tracks. Um, we had an opportunity to open the Raptor up, um, which again, I have mixed emotions about because you don't want to hit anything you don't know if there's a truck broken down on the side or you're going to hit uh, these little mounds. Sometimes there's little mounds of the sand that hit the wind. You don't want to hit one of those at 100 miles an hour. You're in trouble. So I threw the thing in fourth gear and just hit the throttle. And you know we did 100 miles an hour across that, uh, that dry lake bed. 99, 100. 101. A new record. <laughs> At pits two and three, Greg and other members of the chase crew are waiting for the truck. It's still an overpopulated city of race teams and pit workers. Only now it's night and everything changes. We're just getting ready here. We're, uh, we're at Santa Borrego Pits. We just heard from the radio they're at 265 and they're running well. They're in a slow, rocky section now, so it's going to take a few minutes for them to get here. But the truck seems to be running really well. We made a couple real quick uh, shock adjustments at the last pit, and it sounds like it's helped because they haven't complained anymore, so that's a good thing. Um, so I'm just getting ready. 
hoping to get strapped in here and uh, get a drive the, the Raptor R for the first time in, in, a, in a race. That's pretty cool. The constant good news about Raptor is only putting much of the team on edge. They know this is the Baja 1000, where trouble can and will hit you when you least expect it. Okay, we've got, coming up, it's gonna go left and then right, then the danger marker. Well, apparently that's it. <laughs> there may be another one right here. Sorry, dude. <laughs> When you're driving fast in the desert at night, the correct language is crucial when it comes to navigation. He calls out left turn 500 yards. So right before it, right when we get to the left turn, he says, right here. And my brain process is right here. And so he said that probably 15 or 20 times. And I'm like, and as, as I'm jerking right and looking left, I jerk back to the left and get around the corner and I would chew his ass out. Do not do that. Okay, right here. Now go left. Sorry. Sorry about that. Thank you, sir. Never say right here when it's a left. The Raptor is holding up beautifully, with other teams in their class experiencing a number of problems. Everybody else is falling out right now. I don't know if you know. We're running second right now. I can be up beside there, I just can't get in, or how's that I, work? You need to hang back till the fuel's in. Okay. Steve did his job perfect and delivered a perfect truck to Bud. Bud did his section with my guy Mike riding with him and Elliot. They, they come in, they deliver a perfect truck for Gene. are almost perfect. It seems a repair is on the way. We're at the BF Goodrich pit there, and we find there's a couple of tabs cracked underneath the skid plate. Well, there's only three of them on the front holding it in place. So I'm like, well, we need to weld those, because if the other one cracks, then the skid plate folds, and it'll punch, the, punch through the transmission pan, maybe. So to be safe, we pull over, weld the tabs on the, on the skid plate. Well, in order to weld it, we have to shut the car off, and we got to turn the battery off so that you don't smoke the computer. Along with the repair, this stop also brings a switch of drivers as Gene Martindale gets behind the wheel. Soon, they're ready to roll. first got in the truck, it was very rough. Lots of deep whoops, very sharp whoops. Uh, so we had to be real careful of the truck not to overextend the suspension, you know, because it was kind of trophy truck territory. But we were running pretty hard, pretty good. The truck was doing really well. And then we got into some smooth, fast stuff, and the truck really exceeded there because the big power in the engine, the suspension's tuned really well, the tires worked good, really fast. And then we got back into some deep silt, and the four-wheel drive system really saved us. We almost got stuck twice in the, the uh, the four-wheel drive system really pulled us on. That was a big advantage we had, I think. It really helped us, and uh, you know, it's something that's really beneficial to the Raptor system. Hey, hold on, hold on. Okay, we got a 
As well as the truck was running, it wasn't long before co-driver Mike noticed a problem. So we all jump back in our trucks. We got a haul ass now down by San Felipe for the driver exchange where I'm going to get in the truck and do my section. And uh, we get about three miles down the road and we hear this radio. Uh, hey, this is Raptor Race. Uh, we got a problem. We were just dead silence on the radio and they were going over checks and Gene, Gene was on top of it. I just started getting into my groove about 15 minutes or so in, and then my co-driver said, hey, the engine's getting hot, the engine's getting hot, we gotta pull over. So we stopped, and then, then you're like, oh shoot, this could be it, because it got really hot, and we're like, oh shoot, this could be it, the end of the race, we could be done. You want me to get out? Hold on, I gotta call him. Okay. I don't know what happened, dude. I don't either. We didn't hit any rocks or sticks or anything, did we? No, we Huh? Where am I? I can call in. What do you want me to tell him? Tell him we're approaching race mile. Hey, this, this is Raptor Race. Hey, this is Raptor Race. We have lost the radiator. We are approaching mile. Hold on, we're looking at mile up. Hold on. What do you mean, off the radiator? It's overheating. It's overheating. We don't know exactly the details yet. We will let you know. We're looking now. Check your circuit breakers on your fans. What? Check the circuit breakers on the fans. Yeah, one's fine. You, you gotta turn it on and see if it works, right? Huh? It's working. Yeah, it was working. Yeah, we, one fan was working fine. One more fan was working fine. It got hot, right? It pushed too far. We tried to take it easy. We kept climbing the temperature, but now it's at zero. It's pushing out the uh, overflow there. Okay. Um, is there any water left in the radiator? Can you tell that? I can't tell yet. I haven't opened it. Yeah, I, I need to know that, Mud. Do you have any water in the car? No. Do you have any well, we have water? water bag. Yeah, let's get that. Let's hang on. Found the here. Uh, we can't tell. It's so low, we can't tell. We're going to dump both water bags in, our, our drinking water bags. See how full it is and try to run both fans and see if it clears up, okay? That's not enough water if it dumped all the water, Gene. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna fill the two bags and see if we can see the level then, so we can get an idea, okay? Copy that. Just please don't run it with that little bit of water, okay? And four, we will definitely do that. So we had to add water to it. We had to add our drinking water, because we didn't have spare water in the truck, so it's like, well, I guess I'm gonna be thirsty the rest of this run. Something, uh, I don't know what happened yet, Gene and, and Mike and uh, Ollie are in the truck. <coughs> they just radioed out that they uh, lost uh, water or something in the radiator. I, I don't know. So we're trying to head back to them now. We'll find a chase road and get in there. Uh, we got radiators and stuff in the truck, so that's not a big deal, but we got to get to them. So we're going to have to find that chase road and get in there with some water and some tools and stuff like that and figure out what's going on. Yeah. Oh, I, just okay. tell me it didn't suck it down right, right away, but it, we're only at 160. This is Gene. We uh, started up. It did not suck the water down, but the temperature gauge now went up to 180, so we're thinking the no, no, no. is not open. No, no, it's, no. Yeah, it's only at 160. 160? It's at 160 and not okay. 180. If it didn't suck the water down, let it idle for a minute with both fans on. Copy that. We will do that right now. We're at 160. I misspoke. 160, or we're going to let it idle with both fans. Over. You want my theory for a minute? He's going to tell you what he thinks happened. Um, I wonder if when we shut the batteries and everything down to weld on that thing, if the uh, relays did not come back on or something like that for the fans when you first tried to turn them back on. We are thinking the same thing, over. If all the fans are working now, and you've got enough coolant in it where the radiator is full. 
uh, and it's idling okay, then, you know, let's make the decision after we know that. We let it idle, it went up to 170, it has sucked the water down now. Do you want us to add more water and try again? Absolutely. Put more water in. Shut it off and put the water in. You're good, you're good. He said, he said, close it and go. We, th we think it's okay to go. They filled the radiator with their water bags and they confirmed that the fans are running and they said that engine and everything seems fine, so they're going to try to go. We are thinking about rolling here in a few minutes. 30 seconds, we are bubbling in, 30 seconds to go. No problem. The team has decided to take their chances and send the Raptor back into the race, hoping for the best. At this point, there's nothing the chase crews can do. Your fingers crossed on this one. Scattered north of San Felipe, they must wait to hear back from the Raptor before they can make their next move. After race, uh, can you just confirm that you're moving for me? running clean. Okay guys, we need to haul ass back to San Felipe. So we started kind of started cruising along, we're taking it real easy, make sure everything's okay, and it was fine. So I said, okay, well let's go then. So we started started pushing a little harder. We started catching people. It was awesome. I mean, we were still trying to be, just run a good conservative pace, and we were catching people. So the Raptor R was really showing its own. It was really happy how fast it was, and we were just running really smooth. That was a big scare, uh, kind of a false alarm, but if we would have lost the motor, we'd be, we'd be done. That problem never showed back up. But the engine guy, Jim Stevens, he about peed his pants because, you know, he's thinking that they overheated the motor and we're done right then and there. It was relatively smooth sailing for quite a few miles as Raptor made it through the dark and desolate landscape. It was around then that Greg received a position update from his wife back in the States. She was monitoring the race online at Tracker International, and the news was good. Okay, bye. Okay, she said uh, 801 is still stopped, broke down, not moving. 802 is still sitting in Borrego Pit. So, we gotta be in second place right now means our drive the truck nice to finish strategy is the right strategy. Those guys are running their trucks into the ground, it looks like, and uh, downtime is no bueno, if you know what I mean. Got to keep moving. time to give the truck a checkup and to nobody's surprise since it had traveled for so many miles there was a situation that needed to be addressed they come down uh, to the San Felipe exchange uh, when they get there they're like oh we got a little clanking sound a little vibration or something so we look and the driveline had a rock spiral like this in it and the the joint was starting to get sloppy for the two-piece driveline deal they had everything necessary for this very repair 
so there was no debate about what to do next. So we changed, we decided, let's just change it. We got 300 miles to go, we better just change it now. Had all the parts there and a bunch of guys, so we put a drive line in it real quick. Driver change. With Greg Fouts now at the wheel, they make one last check of the radiator. We good? Clear. There's another Class 8, one of the guys that was fixing the steering at 193, coming right behind us, and another 7 truck coming right behind us. I'm like, okay, no problem. I'm not going to try to race him in the whoops. He can pass me. I don't care. That's not our mission. Our mission is to finish, and i got to get a clean truck to Randy to do the last part. Veteran Baja racers know all about the whoops of San Felipe, that roller coaster region that will test your back and dare a driver to hang on to the wheel. San Felipe whoops are this deep and square. Better. Pro truck. Yeah. Sorry, dudes. They're obviously limping. Yeah, that's a... Man, I want to go, I want. I just want to get on top of these, but I know I can't, you know? Uh-huh. The team went into this stretch knowing they had a competing truck directly behind them. But soon, that became more of a question than a fact. So we're cruising. I'm like, where are they at? Mike's like, you got nobody in the mirror. Where are they at? Nobody in the mirror. Where are they at? Nobody in the mirror. So we're 20 miles down the road in these big whoops. I'm like, he should have caught us easily by now. Where are they at? Nobody in the mirror. Big. Sorry, girl. This way? Sure. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe not. I think they're both pretty fucking shitty. What do you think, Craig? Pretty shitty? Welcome to San Felipe. No kidding, man. Huh? Yep. Ooh. I can't believe that that seven truck or that eight truck hasn't caught us. No, there ain't no lights in sight. So I'm like, wow, this is kind of crazy. You know, we're, we're just cruising, taking care of the truck, and he's not catching us. So eventually we get through their ways and he catches us. And you know, it's like this, he's going like a few miles an hour faster and that's it. I'm like, wow, this actually is pretty good. We're, we're right there. We're, we're, we're running second and third place all day now, all of a sudden. The chase crew is stopped. It seems that Ollie, who rode with Gene in the last season, is now sick. We were coming down a hill, and uh, you know, I figured I was just gonna go ahead and lose my lunch, and we'd pull over, and I got out and kind of uh, pretty much collapsed, and you know, shaking, cold, and not a lot of fun. Uh, wound up spending some time uh, on the ground in Baja, you know, just trying to get my bearings back together and uh, get some color back in my skin. I got some fluids, got a little bit of rest. Because all of the drinking water was used to refill Raptor's radiator, Ollie is paying the price. Being dehydrated hundreds of miles from a hospital can be life-threatening. Thankfully, the Raptor team has doctors on hand. 
Pits two and three, race mile 410. Last I heard, the truck was working its way on up through the whoops, and a big truck in those whoops is not a very fun thing. Uh, that's one of the reasons why Greg is in it, uh, because it's gonna require an awful lot of patience to just kind of work its way through. I don't think they're really overdue or due back here probably for another 15 minutes, and that's if they ran really good and clean. So we run through our section, we get to um, up to Borrego Pit, and Jeff Cummings was there from BF Goodrich, you know, and all of our guys were there, go in and take fuel, and Jeff Cummings comes to the window, he says, okay, you're doing good, it's 3 a.m., take your time, you know, do the right thing, be smart, I'm like, yeah, okay. At this early hour, the pit stop goes smoothly. There's gas, tires, and the exchange of a few good words. After that, the drivers are on their way. All pumped up now. We were uh, getting a little sleepy there for a while, but uh, things are going good now. Looks like uh, Greg uh, just went through a pit, uh, BFG pit at mile marker 400, and it turns out he's in first place. We're running just a smooth, good race, and uh, we still got a few more hours to go, but uh, I'll tell you what, things are looking really nice. The truck's in great shape, and it's just running strong, and uh, I think things are really coming together. Entering a new region of the race course, Raptor and the team are about to encounter yet another rugged whoop section. Luckily, it isn't nearly as severe as the last one. At least these are longer than the truck. Lack of sleep combined with a mind-numbing course can lead to some interesting conversation. That was a bobcat trail. Bobcats would run up and down there chasing the gazelle <laughs> and the muskrat. Can they chase a muskrat? Does that even work? Yeah. They can? I don't know. That'd be like breakfast or just a snack or what? For a bobcat? Yeah. It'd be breakfast. Bobcat eating a muskrat? Sounds like a fucking old rock song. Some Bob Dylan would sing. This horrible voice. He was a bobcat chasing a muskrat. More like, ah, <laughs> oh, yeah, that was just Tom Petty, wasn't I? Sorry. Using caution, they're now making the push to get to Valle de Trinidad, but it isn't on a road that most would take to get there. This route is as hazardous and as difficult as it gets. Hey, you got to be careful through here. We just got to get home, right? Yep. Okay, almost a 90 back to the left here. Well, now we're up in these hills where it's super technical, really rough, you know, an area that we don't normally go through to get to Valley to Trinidad. We're going in a back road area. starting to set in I'm starting to get tired I'm driving the truck and I'm like you know in this really technical stuff with drop-offs and stuff like that and I'm starting to not feel good you know it's like uh, I'm, I'm kind of like closing one eye so that I'm not getting blurry vision I'm starting to get real tired normally I'd be I'd be happy it's real technical but I really have to pee and I really need a pad because I can't see very well you know what I mean I hear ya. Oh god. And I'm really tired of whoops. Because it just makes me want to pee worse. <laughs> and so I was telling the guys, well, I, I need to go to the bathroom. So where are the guys at Valley de Trinidad? Well, they're at mile marker, whatever it was. I'm like, we're gonna stop there, tell them I want a power bar, and I'm gonna get out and go to the bathroom. Like 
truck's running fine, running smooth, everything's great. Um, he just wants to uh, get a power bar, something to drink. He's feeling kind of tired. And keep in mind, he's been up 24 hours a day prior, the entire time, you know, leading the chase teams down there on the radio. So he's been up at that time, 36, 37 hours. Uh, Greg wasn't even going to stop. He was just going to do a flyby. We had plenty of gas. He's 30 miles outside of pit four, and uh, Randy's about to get in. So when they get out to go to the bathroom, Elliot or one of the guys comes over to me and says, hey, we got a little problem. We got a, a spring over here. Well, I go over and look at it, and what had happened was the front eye of the spring had broken into about eight pieces and was ripping out of the frame. I'm like, holy crap, what are we going to do, you know? Well, we have one leaf spring with us. So I look at the other spring. The other spring's starting to break, too. So both of the rear springs and the eyes are starting to come apart. So I'm like, well, we can change one now. Randy, on the other side, about 30 miles down the course, across the peninsula, has the other one with his crew. Swapping out springs is usually a quick and easy task, but the Raptor crew discovers another set of major problems. The spring mount has ripped itself off the frame, and without a doubt, this needs to be fixed and fixed now. If that can't happen, they won't be finishing the race. <laughs> Just outside of the Valley to Trinidad, getting ready to go across the peninsula to the, to the Pacific side. And um, they looked underneath the truck, and the, the springs broke, and it was rubbing through the uh, hanger on the frame because it had been broke for so long. So we go over to the Baja Pits guys. You know, they set up these pits all over. It's called Baja Pits. And they had a welder there. And uh, so we go over to that pit, and I'm underneath there with a little, you know, wire feed booger welder welding boogers onto the spring hanger to build it up where the spring had rubbed a hole through it. They have like some old rebar and junk like that, so I'm underneath there welding pieces of crappy old metal to it to build it up a little bit so to hopefully it'd be strong enough to make it. Gene's there, who had gotten out of the truck earlier, and he's like, dude, are you okay? You look like crap. He goes, are you gonna be all right? You want me to drive this section? I'm like, I'll be okay. So the Baja Pit guys happen to have some coffee. So I'm getting coffee and it's kind of cold. Ugh, shotgunning it like shots and eating power bars. But the lack of sleep is having its effect not only on Greg, but also on the entire crew here in the Valley de Trinidad. Meanwhile, across the peninsula is last leg driver Randy Merritt. He's waiting for his turn at BF Goodrich Pit 4, and he's been up all night as well. Everybody was really tired. Trying to sleep was impossible. Everybody, take a nap, take a nap. You know, you're sitting there waiting for a truck. You know, you're calling, calling, trying to get updates, and uh, you can't really sleep. At that time, nobody in Pit 4 really knew the exact status of the truck. They'd all heard bits and pieces, but accurate facts were hard to come by. There's so much stuff going on and so many people involved, and ended up being there were welding brackets, everything was torn apart, so they got that going, and I don't remember what time it was, but it all of a sudden starts getting daylight, and we were really tired, and you start kind of getting awake, I guess, because you think it's time to get up. With a new day arriving, the Raptor team is more determined than ever to get back into the race. After making the repair, finding that reviving form of energy that only a desert sunrise can bring. So we get going across the peninsula, and now it feels all right, and everything's okay. We pass a couple of cars going through there, and now we're on these fast kind of like rally roads. And, uh, you know, we got about five or 10 miles before we get to Randy, and I'm, all of a sudden we're having fun now. You know, it's like, hey, this is pretty fun up in here. So we're power sliding through the corners and stuff like that, skating through there, having a good time, you know, laughing a little bit. Okay, right 90 degrees, just after this little hill. After all of this that we've gone through, you know, we probably lost three or four hours with uh, the drive line 
and then changing the two springs and fixing stuff. We, we had easily four hours of downtime, and here we are still running third place in class eight when Randy took the truck. The second spring could now be addressed as well as any other problems the truck was experiencing. The home stretch is in sight for Team Raptor, and everyone knows, even with repairs, it's all going better than anyone could have expected. Changed the other spring, put it on there, sent Randy off on his way. Hey, is that coffee? Hey, can, can I have a cup of coffee? Of course. If I say please? Oh, pretty please. Pretty please? Oh. Yeah. It's the final leg, and at this point, if you're still in the race, the finish line seems right around the corner. for a while and jump off and there's some dirt roads. Uh, we went to the Pacific side, we went by the ocean. Randy has a really cool section, a really fast section. Um, he's got a section up the coast that's unbelievable. A lot of streets and um, highway and um, just a lot of local round houses and stuff we were racing through. And once we got about to, I don't know, about 560 miles, wherever it was, and we started turning into the stuff we were dreading, which was the Silt Hills. couldn't get the four-wheel drive to work anymore, so my co-driver, he's a Ford tech, and he knew exactly what to do. He got out, got underneath the truck, locked them all in manually, and we just started climbing hills. By now, the same thought is hitting Randy and every other member of the Raptor team. If they're doing this well and getting this close, there's no reason for a better place showing to be out of reach. Well, as we were getting closer, I guess we were catching up to the second place truck. So we're all racers and it's like, all right, we want to finish, but if we can gain another position, let's go for it. And we had a lot of talk in the truck, you know, this and that. We're thinking about, well, they had to replace this, you know, but I think we can save it. So we just went for it. He's about, I don't know, 20 miles out, bringing it to the finish. And within that 20 miles, Randy's going for it. He's pushing it hard, trying to catch the second place truck. Randy's doing great, truck rolling flawless. Uh, we're gaining on everybody. Race mile 596, truck stops. We don't know what happened.
we crossed the road and there's a big blockage of somebody rolled a truck off the side of a hill and they're break they're blocking the course and we couldn't get around there was probably about 20 25 vehicles that were all stuck together you are on what amounts to a goat trail in the middle of the mountains stuck behind a rolled truck welcome to the Takati score Baja 1000 and the second place truck you were gaining on 806 is ahead of the wreck and headed for the finish line the attrition rate for the 1000 this year was nearly 40 percent and you can tell looking at the faces of those who finished that this course was a monster the news finally gets to Greg. Ah, oh, shit, you're kidding me. Randy's sitting there at 595. Susag is already moving. He's got 20 minutes on him already. Can't do anything. Who's holding him? I don't know. Race control or? I don't know. Maybe we should find that out. When you have a problem, you go to the boss. Sal Fish. Okay, do you know anything about uh, vehicles being held up at mile uh, 595? 595. Have you heard anything? Yes, sir. We had a vehicle truck rolled there, was blocking the course. Nobody could get by. Uh, 806 has since been cleared of the course. He is proceeding down the racetrack, and the other guys are moving out. They're thinning out as they uh, have the opportunity. A second place finish is no longer a possibility for Team Raptor, but nobody seems to mind. They had uh, some bottleneck up in the last 50 miles of the course, so it gave everybody time that were all over all over Baja to convene at the finish before they got there. Hitting over 30 hours of no sleep, the team runs on the excitement of a dream come true. You know, there was this dirt mound at the at the line where everybody was gathered up, and there was a sea of orange and black Raptor shirts that you could see. It's like we owned that whole crowd. 25 hours ago, a truck barely two weeks old took off from this very mound of dirt to do battle with the toughest race on earth, and it was one good fight. scheduled it, we planned for it, but you know when it happens, it's even more sweet than you could ever expect. Finishing the Baja 1000 with the Raptor truck, such a great learning opportunity for us, it's a prove out opportunity, and while we were here engineering, what happened was a race broke out. By golly, we finished third, we're happy. 30 hours ago, we were in a parking lot, wondering if the car's even gonna start, and we just finished the race, I don't even know what the time was, we finished the race third in our class. I feel great. You know, it's, it's been, you know, three months of hard work with all the engineers. We proved it was Ford Tough, and it, it's just a great feeling. I wish all my, uh, you know, co-workers at Ford could be here um, and just feel a sense of pride that, you know, we just came out here and we finished just like we said we would. The camaraderie of the whole, you know, all 40, 50 guys. We're all proud to be something that's larger just than ourselves. Finishing this race after the push we've done for the last three or four months is like... It's the end. Everybody did exactly what needed to be done. Everybody pitched in 100%. And look at where we are, a third place finish at the Baja 1000 with a brand new Raptor truck to show the world how tough these F-150s are.
Okay, so you're driving up to the lake for the weekend when suddenly a big boat pulls up next to you and you notice, hey, it's yours. That's when it occurs to you that while having a lot of towing power is nice, a little control to go with it would be great too. Enter the Ford F-150. It's got the most towing and now an advanced trailer sway control system. And guess what? It's standard. Anchors away, baby. It's not just a pickup truck. It's a Ford F-150. Okay, so the Ford F-150 is the only truck with those new steps on the tailgate and the side of the box, making it easier to get to the cargo. And you're thinking, eh, and I need those. Oh, yeah? Let's do the math. How many times are you going to be in and out of the cargo box? Once? Twice? No. I'm thinking 50, maybe 60,000 times, especially since it's got the most payload. You see what I'm getting at? Hey, unless all you're carrying is yarn, it seems like a no-brainer to me, okay? It's not just a pickup truck. It's a Ford F-150. Get the lights to the finish line first, you'll win. The new KC Highlights 70 watt carbon fiber light pod. KC Highlights, we come alive at night. here at Racing Deans and we have a special visit from uh, Mario Fiolka and friends from the AOK team and uh, Nick sent us $800 for the Baja Marina Kindergarten which we are looking forward to build the restroom for all the kids. Thank you Nick for this great support. Team 
Wahoo is our charity run that's my sponsor. And the, the, the fire department, the full house racing guys, the big ball. We will come back again next year to try to do more for them when we come back for a race next year. Dice que a través de la fundación de los corredores de Los Ángeles, a través de Emma y Bianca, del señor Baldwin, van a regresar con obra de calidad todavía para el siguiente año, así con todos ustedes. That's awesome. It's great to see a bunch of kids smiling, happy. Uh, you know, Nick and uh, the firefighters, everyone doing something to uh, help improve a town like San Felipe where we come down to race. It's great. It's just giving back. Baja giving back. People who come and race in Baja get so much out of it, and the people here are such great hosts. It's really cool to see those who come down here and have so much fun give something back, and you just look at the, look at the kids' eyes, and you can tell. It's, it's, it's a pretty special deal. This is good. Hey everybody, this is Marty Fiocchi from Team Wahoos. We're all here at the Kindergarten in San Felipe. Thanks to the friends at Wahoos Fish Tacos, Blue Sea Communications, BF Goodrich, Four Wheel Parts. All you guys helped make this happen. Alpen Stars, thank you so much. We're here feeding 200 kids today in San Felipe. We wouldn't have done it without you. Also want to thank Nick Baldwin and AOK for making this happen. It's really touching to be here, and we want to thank all our sponsors for making the Team Wahoos Baja Charity Run 2 happen. We'll see you again next year. Here is the Amphis uh, combination tool, uh, very similar to the ones we use up in Los Angeles. Uh, it's capable of, uh, well, it's also known as the Jaws of Life, is what everyone knows it as. But uh, it's capable of uh, spreading cars open after an accident, a lot of cars, a lot of mangled metal. This is the one they had before, old school right here. Look at these things. These things are ancient, they weigh a ton. That's probably a fraction of what this weighs right here. What is this? This is about 50 pounds. <laughs> This one belongs in the museum now. This thing will cut three times as much as this and much, much lighter. So they're going to be loving it, you know. Otherwise, it's going to be Everybody, we just got done giving the full house jaws of life to the local fire department here in San Felipe. And now, as an added bonus, we actually found a second jaws of life thanks to Bill Black and the folks at Fire Etc. We're going to give those to the local Red Cross here in San Felipe. So it's not one jaws of life, but two. I'm ready to give those to them right now. Come on. Oh, the charity was great. The kids were outstanding. That was a blast. I've never done that before, and I think we need to do it every year we come down here. Now it, it was—it's a, a lot of satisfaction in that, you know, giving the kids and, and what Nick's doing, and the jaws of life to the fire department. It, it, that was really cool to uh, to see that and, and uh, give them some new equipment that, that's uh, badly needed. The, the, the charity portion, you know, giving the jaws of life uh, to the fire department. All the food to those kids, those cute little Mexican kids, that, that was just awesome. Uh, we really enjoyed doing that. Something that should be carried on for, for years to come. The charity part of the 2008 Wahoos Fish Tacos Baja Charity Run is now kind of complete. We're happily dropped the food off to the schools. We've got two Jaws of Life down here in San Felipe. And now it's time to go back to what we kind of came for. The second reason, actually, is to go race. We're going to go pre-run and see how the race goes for the team. I want to thank again everybody who helped make this happen, especially the Full House Fire guys and Bill Black from um, Fire Etc. who donated the Jaws of Life and looks like we've done some good here in San Felipe.